John's Gospel, chapter 14. Sunday night, we go through the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. We come to chapter 14. It is impossible to understand John chapter 14 without understanding, unless we understand the single great word and theme that dominates the chapter. Now, in the originals, of course, when John wrote and Paul wrote in the New Testament, there were no chapter and verses. These were added later by the translators. I'm not complaining about it. I'm thankful for them. But sometimes we can stop at the end of a chapter and assume that some number of days have gone by or whatever and that we're beginning something entirely different. And that's not what's happening here. There is a continuation from what was began in chapter 13 and there is no break at the end of verse 38. It continues on into verse 1 of chapter 14. And what is the great single great word that dominates and sets the tone and the context for chapter 14. It is the word separation. And in chapter 13, verse 33, Jesus had spoken to the disciples and said, Little children, I say to you, uh, little children, I shall be with you a little while longer and you'll seek me. And as I said to the Jews, where I'm going, you cannot come. So now I say to you, he speaks to them of the fact that he is going to leave them. And surely he's speaking about the three days and three nights that he spent in the heart of the earth between the time of his death upon the cross and his resurrection. But he's also speaking out into the distance a little bit to the 40 days after his resurrection to the time of his ascension when he would be ascended into heaven to the right hand of the Father waiting for the word from the Father to come back for us. And Peter was so dominated by Jesus' speaking of his separation that he missed completely when Jesus gave the new commandment to love one another just as Jesus had loved us. And Peter comes in and says, listen, where are you going that we can't go? I'll follow you to death. I don't understand this. And, and the Lord then prophesied to Peter concerning his coming denials of the Lord. And so, in response to the troubled heart of the disciples because of this separation, Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. So here is a chapter that's written for heart trouble. And God has known all through the ages that we as His people living in this earth, this is not home for us. We're passing through this place. Heaven is my home. That's where my heart is. That's where my treasure is. That's where I long to be. On the day of His choosing, but that's where I long to be, is in heaven. But in the meantime, between now and and the time that he returns for me, either individually or at the time of the rapture of the church, there's going to be things that happen in this world that are going to trouble me. And the image here is of kind of a washing machine. If you ever lift the lid on a washing machine and hold the button and watch it go back and forth, and it's agitating the water like that, that that's the condition of their heart. They're really troubled by this news. They're really, really unsettled. By this news, Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. They have been used to a relationship with Jesus that has required very little faith of them. The relationship that they've had with Jesus has been one of walking by sight and not by faith. All of that's going to change. 
And now they're going to have a relationship with Jesus in the same way that they had a relationship with the Father. And the relationship that they had with the Father was one that was based not upon seeing for my faith, but based upon faith. And they did have a relationship with the Father. They had a healthy relationship on the basis of not seeing, but on the basis of faith. And Jesus said, now the relationship that you've had with the Father, that same kind of relationship, a faith-based relationship, no longer one where I'm just right there where you can see me and physically touch me and these things, but it's, it's going to be different. It's going to be like the one you have with the Father. It's going to change. Now, when Jesus says, you believe in God, believe also in me, that is ascribing to himself deity. Only someone equal with the Father could say that. He said, you believe in God, believe also in me. I mean, which one of us could say that? And have it produce any comfort in another human heart. We could say it, and they'd run. Listen, you believe in God, believe also in me. Ah, you know, they go heading out. But he could say it. Nobody blinked, and nobody blinks to this day because he's equal to the Father. What would you and I have to say? You believe in God, pray for me. <laughs> and he said, in my Father's house, they're wondering where it is that he's going to go. He said, I'm going to my Father's house. And in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. Now, this is complete Jewish imagery in terms of, of, of ancient times. In Jewish history, when a family would own property. Somewhere along the line, a father would build a house on the center of that property, somewhere on that property. And then, if he had sons, and he'd kill his wife trying to have sons, if he had sons, then when his sons grew up and it was time to marry, there would be an arranged marriage with a daughter of some other household. And after the marriage had been arranged, they would be engaged in our language for a period of a year. And during that year period, the son would come back to the father's house and he would add on to the father's house a living quarter now for his bride and for the future family. The, 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 the family unit is entirely different in the Middle East, even to this day in, in, in the Eastern culture. We're a very, very independent people here. And there's good things and there's bad things about it. But in those days, there was safety in building all of the family. They all lived in the same place. And Jesus, using the Jewish imagery and also identifying himself as the groom and the disciples and us Christians as the bride, that he was going to go into heaven in order to add on to the Father's house onto heaven in anticipation of bringing his bride there. Now, I love, I love the way that Jesus describes heaven. And he describes heaven as a Father's house. <laughs> Isn't it like family up there? It's a father's house. And I also like when Jesus said, if it were not so, I would have told you. If I was just clearing out, because you, 11, have failed me miserably, and I think we're going to try this again a different way. <laughs> he said, I would have told you. He said, I'm not skipping out on you. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. And I go to prepare a place for you. 
Heaven's a prepared place. I remember when I was a new Christian and I heard somebody say it. I don't know if it was in a pulpit or on the radio or on a tape or something. Where somebody declared that the Lord Jesus created the heavens and the earth in six days. And He's been preparing heaven for His bride for 2,000 years. Can you imagine what it looks like? No. I can't. It's going to be incredible. And one of the frustrations that people have, frustration in God's people concerning heaven, is that there isn't more in the Bible to describe heaven. To tell us what's it going to be like exactly and just exactly what are we going to be doing and and what does this prepared place look like. And and sometimes there's some real chagrin over a lack of information related to it. But I I agree with a man by the name of Vance Havner. If, If you've ever read anything by Vance Havner, he's just great. Gone on to be with the Lord now. He said, there are a lot of questions the Bible doesn't answer about the hereafter. But I think one reason is illustrated by the story of a boy sitting down to a bowl of spinach when there's a chocolate cake at the end of the table. He's going to have a rough time eating that spinach when his eyes are on the cake. And if the Lord had explained everything to us about what's ours to come, I think we'd have a rough time with our spinach down here. And the fact of the matter is is that he has told us all we need to know about heaven Because all we need to know is that it's a prepared place and he's been 2,000 years preparing it for his bride. And he says to them, and if I go to prepare a place for you, and he did, I will come again, and he will, and receive you to myself. You notice he doesn't say, and receive you to heaven. Why is heaven going to be heaven? Because he's there. If he wasn't there, it could be the most beautiful place in the universe. But without his presence is not heaven. It's heaven because the groom is going to come to get the bride and to take him to that prepared place to enjoy one another's company. And so he said that I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. Heaven is in my future. Heaven is in your future, if you know the Lord tonight. (laughs) More sure than the seats that you sit in and the platform that I stand on is the fact that one day we will stand in heaven's glory before that throne. And we will cast those crowns before His throne. And we will sing praises to Him forever and ever and ever and ever. Because Jesus has said that that's what He has saved us to. That where I am, there you may be also. And where I go you know, and the way you know. And Jesus had been telling the religious leaders all along about the fact that he had come from the Father, he was going to go to be with the Father, and and all. And so he said, you know, where I go, you know, to the Father, you know, the way that you know, you know, he's been talking about his death, his burial, his resurrection and all. And Thomas, known as Doubting Thomas, and and you've got to give Thomas credit, he pipes up and he gets corrected all of the time, but he's not the kind of guy that can just listen to something, not understand it, nod his head. So Jesus has said, listen, the way, where I go you know, and the way you know. And Thomas said to him, uh, Lord, we don't know where you're going. And how can we know the way? So he says one thing, we don't know where you're going. And then he asks a question, how can we know the way? And verse 6, which is one of the most astonishing in all of the Bible is an answer to Thomas's question. And Jesus declares to Thomas and to all of mankind's sense, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. 
Thomas said, Lord, we don't know where you're going. Jesus said, I'm going to the Father. Thomas asked, how can we uh, you know, know the way? And Jesus answers that question by saying, I am the way, the truth and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Jesus is the way. He is the way to heaven. He isn't just one who came along to show the way. I would, have accept, I would accept that. But that's not what he's saying here. It isn't even saying supremely that he has provided the way. He has provided the way. But that's not what he's saying here. He's saying, I am the way. I am the way to get into heaven. I am the entrance into heaven. No one gets into heaven but by me. And you must be in me to get to heaven. That's what he's declaring. I am the way. And you note the singularity of it. I'm not one of several ways. (laughs) I'm the way. There's only one way. And I'm it. And he declares that he is not only the way, but he is the truth. What's he saying there? He is saying that I am the truth about everything. And I don't care how many degrees a person has or how smart they think they are. I am the truth. And everything that I say is the truth. The truth about how to live a life. The truth about God. And what he's like. The truth about the way of salvation. It's all found in me. I don't merely speak the truth. I am the truth. When you saw me walk and you saw me work and you saw me do and you heard me speak. You saw and you heard truth in its purest form. I'm the truth. I'm the way, the truth, and then he said, I'm the life. All life is found in Jesus. He is the creator of the heavens and of the earth, the Bible declares. By him, Paul wrote to the Colossians, all things consist. They're all held together tonight by him. You are held together tonight by him. We have life tonight, even the life to reject him tonight. Because He gives us that life. But not only does He give physical life, but He is the source of abundant life. You'll have life and that more abundantly, He said. And He is also the only source of everlasting life. It's all found in Him. And then He makes the thing that makes some Christians cringe. It makes me want to learn how to do handstands and juggle and set off fireworks. I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. I am the way, singular. I am the truth, singular. I am the life, singular. And just in case you didn't get it, no one gets into Heaven apart from me. What he has just done, C.S. Lewis later on made popular by declaring that in that statement, Jesus has created what is known as the trilemma for mankind. And that is, in making a statement like that, you can no longer categorize him simply as a great teacher or a great role model or as a great example on how to live your life. That statement takes him out of that category. And that statement is designed 
and given in order that no one on the face of this planet who ever becomes familiar with his life would ever be able to say concerning Jesus Christ, he was simply a great man or a great moral teacher, or a great moral example. He has removed that as an option from every single thinking person. And the trilemma that he's produced is, you have to come to one of three conclusions concerning him. He is either exactly what he said he was, and that is the Lord, and ought to be made the Lord of every single human life, Or he is a liar in having said this, and no one ought to follow him. Or he was a lunatic out of his mind. And everyone must choose one of those three. But choose on the basis of the record of Scripture concerning who he is. This world is nuts. It's driving me crazy. I should stop reading the letters to the editor in the Modesto B, but I don't. And there's a fellow who writes every so often from Turlock, and I won't name him. And I don't mind when he's talking about street improvements or military things or something, but he seems determined to write regularly about spiritual things. And he's got this idea that all paths lead to the same place, that basically all religions are saying the same thing. And that for any religion or any religious leader to say that they are the only way, that that is narrow. And because it's narrow in this culture, it must, by virtue of being narrow, also be wrong. Let me tell you something. Or they say it's intolerant. Truth is always intolerant. It can never be anything but intolerant. Truth will always be intolerant of a lie. You can't have truth without intolerance. I don't know what dream world people are living in. They say this is too narrow when Jesus says that He is the only way. The issue is not narrowness. The issue is truth. If God has chosen to save man by a broad means, by many paths, fine, I'm all for it. If that's how He wants to do it. But if He has chosen instead to save man by one means and through one salvation, then I'm fine with that. I am so thrilled that there is a salvation. I am so thrilled that there is one place for the forgiveness of sins in a new life. And to me, the issue is not narrow or broad. The issue is, what is the truth? And if a person rejects the claims of Jesus because his claims are narrow, then you better take that out throughout the rest of your daily life. And if narrowness is wrong there, then it must be wrong everywhere else. But I've noticed people like narrowness in their pharmacist. When I go get a prescription, I expect one kind of pill in that body. I don't expect the pharmacist to say, you know, the doctor gave me that to to me. and It seemed a little narrow to give me to give you just one kind of pill. I gave you 45 different kinds. There you go. We like narrowness in our air traffic controllers, don't we? 
If you're a pilot and you're bringing a jet in, you say, listen, where do you want me to land this thing? He says, listen, land it wherever you want. (laughs) We're letting everybody land where they want tonight. (laughs) They say, be narrow. Tell me what runway nobody else is going to be on and we can land with safety. We like, we like narrowness in our surgeons. I do, anyway. If he's supposed to go in and get the appendix, I don't want him going in and taking several other things at the same time because the appendix was too narrow-minded in terms of a diagnosis. Now it's silly, isn't it? It's silly, isn't it? Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. And that's the truth. And bounce off, sell it. And don't apologize for me concerning that. You tell people that about me. And then you trust me by my Holy Spirit to cause them to see the truthfulness of that in the same way that I did you. Beautiful, beautiful verse. And Jesus declared, if you had known me, you would have known my Father also. And from now on, you know him and have seen him. And Philip said to Jesus, Lord, show us the Father and it will be sufficient for us. Lord Jesus, listen, if you're leaving us and we're not going to be able to, you know, see you face to face anymore and we're going to have to deal with you in the realm of faith, then uh, maybe you could show us the Father and that would help us in, in the separation. Philip is he's not asking for much, is he? And Jesus said to Philip, he said, have I been with you so long and you haven't known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Philip, when I cleansed the leper, you saw the Father. When I raised the widow at name, you saw the Father. When I turned the water into wine, Philip, you saw the Father. When I spoke the Sermon on the Mount, Philip, you heard the Father. He that has seen me has seen the Father. Philip, we are completely united in everything that my life has been about, both in works and in words. Notice as he says in verse 10, For do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me, the words that I speak to you. I don't speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does these works. In other words, the teaching was from Him. And believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works. Every work I did, the Father was involved. You've seen and heard the Father every step of the way for three and a half years. Or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. And then beginning in verse 12, Jesus begins to comfort and continue to comfort the disciples by giving them promises concerning himself and what he's going to provide for them to get them through this period of separation. And he said, most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will, all, he will do also in greater works than these he will do because I go to my Father. He said the separation that you don't want to occur is a good thing because it is going to allow you to do greater works than I've done. Greater in what way? Certainly greater in number. Jesus in His incarnation willfully took upon Himself the limitations of human flesh. So He could only be one place at one time. And we have no record that He ever left the uh, territory of Israel. He went up into Sidon. He went up into Lebanon a little bit. But most of His time was spent in a very small region. He could only be one place at one time. 
And yet on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit would come upon the church, and the church would be spread out throughout all of the world, they would no longer be limited to one place. And now God would be able to do miracles through them and through us and teach through them and through us. So the separation was a good thing because it would result in even more miracles. And the book of Acts chronicles all of that. But also, the miracles would be greater in their quality. Because it would not be until following his death and His burial, and His resurrection, that men and women could be saved and enter into heaven's glory. And as wonderful as all of the miracles were in the raising of the dead, and the cleansing of the lepers, and the healing of the blind men, and all of these kinds of things, there is a miracle that is greater than that, and it is the miracle of a life being saved. And so he speaks to them and said, listen, I'm going to go, but my going is going to allow the Spirit of God to come in order that the miracles and the works would be greater both in number and their quality. And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I'll do it. Now here, again, the context is separation. Well, how are we going to, how are we going to talk to you? <laughs> You've always been right there. I mean, we just could look across the fire and bump you and ask you a question. Or, you know, what are we, how are we going to communicate to you? And Jesus now speaks to them, comforts them concerning the separation, and begins to speak to them about this thing called prayer. And He gives them extraordinary promises related to prayer. And whatsoever you ask in My name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in My name, I'll do it. Now that word, in My name, that's a qualifying statement. So when we ask for something in Jesus' name, we close our prayers. Most of us do, don't we? We pray whatever we're going to pray, and then we close it and we say, in Jesus' name. Sometimes, in saying that in Jesus' name, there's the idea that now we've got Him in a headlock. God's got to come through and He's got to give me that Lamborghini because I asked for it in Jesus' name. (laughs) But to ask something in someone's name in that culture was to ask in accordance with their nature. Their name represented their nature. And so Jesus is saying, if you ask anything in accordance with my nature, I'll do it. If you ask anything that I would ask for in that same circumstance, I'll do it for you. But if I don't think you need a Lamborghini, I reserve the right to say no to you because it's not asked in His nature. Now, He makes the promise to who? Anyone, anybody can just pray these kinds of things and get whatever. No, He makes this promise to disciples. And who are disciples? Disciples are men and women who have, at some point in time in their life, agreed to deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow after Him. And so He said, ask me anything that a person who is denying themselves has taken up their cross and is following me, anything that they would ask, and I'll give that to you. So he's put some parameters on it. Now, it is a tremendous promise nonetheless, though to cause the health and wealth thing to collapse. Because what Jesus is saying is, I'm leaving you. But everything that you have asked me to do when I have been in your presence, and hasn't it gone swimmingly, I will do when you ask from here in my name. It will be just like I'm here and you're talking to me in terms of my response to the prayer. And it's intended to provoke tremendous boldness in prayer. 
in our lives in this place of separation that we're in. And then Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Well, how were they supposed to show their love to Jesus if he's going to be ascended to the Father? I mean, when he was there, Peter could go up, get him in a headlock, and give him some of that, you know, that old Indian knuckle rub thing. I'm not saying he did. I'm just saying he could have. But there was Jesus right in their physical presence in order to show your affection to him. You could just go up and give him a big old Jewish hug any old time you wanted. But he's not going to be there anymore like that. So how can I hug him? Obey his word. How can I tell him, I love you? I love you. And the way that I can tell him that I love him is by simply obeying his word. And that's how he interprets our obedience to his word. And he said, and I will pray in light of this separation, the Father, and he will give you another helper, literally a comforter, paracletos. It's a name for the Holy Spirit, one who comes alongside to help. He said, I will pray to the Father in my separation. He will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever. The spirit of truth and the spirit always tells us the truth about Jesus, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him for he dwells with you and he will be in you. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. He said, I know you're bummed out about the fact that I'm talking about leaving you, talking about the separation, but I'm going to send you another helper, the Spirit of Truth, speaking of the Holy Spirit. And that word another is a fascinating one in the original language because it means another after the first kind. Now, occasionally in my house at home, uh, we have pinwheel cookies there. And uh, they're good. And they're best frozen. Marshmallow gets hard and all of that. And you put the pinwheel cookies in the freezer. And sometimes I'll go in and I'll get a pinwheel cookie out and I'll sit down to watch the Raiders lose. I don't want them to. They just, they just do it all by themselves. So I sit down with my pinwheel cookie, and sometimes with a pinwheel cookie, you eat it, and that hasn't quite satisfied you. So if I were to shout to my wife and I were to say, listen, would you go get me another cookie? And if she went into the cupboard and brought me a ginger snap... There's another word in the original language for the word another that means another of a different kind. That's what she would be doing. But let me tell you, there is a world of difference in my mind between a chocolate pinwheel and a ginger snap. Ginger snaps can stay in a cupboard in my house and be there forever. I am no threat to them. But the word that Jesus uses here is for, get me a cookie, another one like the first one. So she would go and get a pinwheel. And when Jesus speaks here of another comforter, He says concerning the Holy Spirit, I am sending you another helper just like the first one. Who was the first one? Jesus was the first one. And everything that I have been to you, And for you, he will be to you and for you, lacking nothing. Only the coming of the Holy Spirit is even superior to what Jesus could do. Because he said at the end of verse 17, For he dwells with you, para, all around us. The Holy Spirit is all around everyone in this world. And then he said, and he will be in you. That's something that Jesus never did in his incarnation as it relates to the disciples' life. As close as they could be is me to you. 
And as close as that is, there's something greater, and that is if you came inside of me. That is intimacy off of the graph. That is a come alongside to help you that is beyond description. So they're bummed out about the fact that Jesus is going and Jesus says, listen, the Holy Spirit is coming and everything that I have been to you and for you, He will be only, He will be it inside of you. The intimacy will be even greater. What a comfort. (laughs) Well, this is for me. (laughs) And a little while longer, He said, and the world will see me no more, but you'll see me. Because I live, you live also. That that day, at that day, you will know that I am in the Father, and you in me, and I in you. In other words, he's talking about his death, his burial, his resurrection. He said, as soon as that happens, the lights will go on for you. He said, he who has my commandments and keeps them, he returns to this theme over and over again. He who has my commandments, not enough to just have the commandments. He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father. The Father loves everyone, but there is a special love apparently that is from the Father toward the one that obeys Jesus. He will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. The life of obedience is the life of revelation. He said, you obey me, and I will manifest myself to you. I'll reveal myself to you. Apparently, the Lord does not feel compelled to reveal anything to a person unless the person has already been obedient to do what He's already told them to do. Why should He tell them the next thing to do if they've already proven they're not interested in obeying in their disobedience. So he doesn't feel compelled to reveal anything anymore. And maybe some of us can be here tonight. There's disobedience in our life, but we're wanting revelation from God, wisdom from God over in this area over here. He doesn't feel compelled to give it to us. Why should he? If I treat his commands that way. But he says, if you obey me, he said, I'll manifest myself to you. That is the life of revelation. And Judas, not a scary, kind of a bummer to have that name. We know him as Thaddeus elsewhere in the Scriptures. <laughs> There's a name ruined for the world, wasn't it? Perfectly good name, Judas. Judas ruined it. But Judas, not a scary, said to him, Lord, how is it that you'll manifest yourself to us and not to the world? How are you going to pull this off? And Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him, and we will make our home with him. So they're expecting now that Jesus, how can you reveal yourself to us without revealing yourself to the world? And they're expecting Jesus to do some kind of a big physical kind of thing, you know, in in establishing his uh, kingdom and that kind of deal. And they say, anything you would do outwardly, the world would see also. So how can you do something outwardly that we would see and they would? see and so they wouldn't you know they wouldn't see it but don't get this whole thing maybe i'm making it more complicated than it is but that's what's going on there and jesus speaks to them as he raises that and he says if anyone loves me he'll keep my word my father will love him and he and we will father and son come to him and make our home with him and the word home there make our home with him it means that god will come into our lives and that he'll settle down and they'll make themselves at home So when God says, I'm going to reveal things to you, it doesn't mean that, you know, it's like He writes on the walls where everybody could see and everybody could know, or He doesn't speak audibly. Damien, listen, here, take a left, take a left. It doesn't do that. I mean, then everybody would hear it and know. How does He do it privately? By coming in my heart by the Holy Spirit. And that's what God has done. He's come into our lives and He's settled down to make Himself at home in our lives. And because He lives inside of my heart, He communicates His will. He reveals His will to me. You ever left a situation where you did exactly what God told you to do and you walk away and what's going on inside of you? That was so right. (laughs) Yeah. 
I'm going to be hard to live with for 48 hours. Man, that was so good, you know, and everything. What's going on? It's the Father and Son inside of us by the Holy Spirit. And they're so into what just happened that they felt at home inside. And and our lives are a home. The Holy Spirit lives inside of us. Ever been in a situation where you're watching something or doing something and it's not right, not right, not right, not supposed to be here, <laughs> not supposed to be doing that, you know, and the whole, and you, it is just complete, everything is completely unsettled inside. What's going on? The Holy Spirit's tearing the pillows apart on the couch in the living room. Because He lives inside of us and wherever I go and I put myself into the middle of, I'm taking Him into the middle of that. And so He has His ways of communicating to us so privately. Revealing Himself so privately that it can be happening and five and a half other billion people in the world don't even know it's happening. Because it's happening by the Spirit of God. And He said, He who does not love Me does not keep My words. And the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. And so again, the importance of obedience, the way to say, I love you to God. Those of you who have uh, raised children and raised them through the teen years, uh, those of you who haven't, (laughs) you're in our prayers. No, it's it's a good time. (laughs) I mean, pretty good. (laughs) All right, so it's a little rough at times. But sometimes they can hit those rebellious pockets, and when they're living in absolute rebellion to you, and then they come into the room and they say, I love you. How much does that I love you mean to you? I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you. (laughs) If you love me, do what I say. That's what the Father's saying here. That's what Jesus is saying here. The way to show that I love. And these things I've spoken to you while being present with you, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, He will teach you all things. How many of you um, uh, began to try and read the Bible before you were born again? Just a quick show of hands. Up high, real quick. So you see that. Uh-huh. How'd that go for you? <laughs> the fairly dead book, wasn't it? I remember we, we'd be playing uh, basketball in, in uh, junior college, and they'd put us in these rooms, you know, and the only reading material, no TVs or anything, the only reading material is a like Gideon's Bible. I'd pull it out, and I'd try to read it. Wow. What is that all about? And now the book is the love of my life. Why? Because the author's come inside of me now. He's come inside of me. And why? Because the teachers come inside And so He does it, doesn't He? He teaches us the Word of God. He'll teach you all things, and then He'll bring it to your remembrance. And this becomes more and more something you're appreciative of the older you get. But have you ever been in that thing? And notice that it's necessary to put the Word of God in my mind, to have it in my heart in order for Him to bring it to remembrance. But you ever been in one of those conversations where, you know, you start to talk to somebody about something and you all of a sudden, you quote a verse to them and you go, man, I don't know what I'm going to say after that verse. And this person really knows their stuff and this kind of thing. And you step out in that verse and all of a sudden the Lord gives you the next verse and the next verse and the next verse and the next verse. And then you walk away from that thing, you know, the verse came. I mean, it just went so good. What was happening? The Spirit of God was bringing the Word that you had sown into your heart to your remembrance. He's so faithful to do it. And it's a work of the Spirit. He said, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. The world can't give peace. The only one that can really give true peace. The world tries to give peace. But only God can give peace because the source of my peace must, must always be greater than the things that would rob me of my peace. And only God is greater than the circumstances of this world. And so God gives us a peace that the world can never give because only He is greater than this world. And so He said, let not your heart be troubled. Where have we heard that before? Verse 1. He closes it now. It's all framed in. 
Here are the promises. Here are the comforts for God's people all through the ages living separate from a face-to-face relationship with the Lord Jesus. All the things that He's provided for us. And so He hems it in on the other end. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. You have heard me say to you, I'm going away and coming back to you. They miss that. (laughs) And if you love me, you would rejoice because I said I'm going to the Father. For my Father is greater than I. And, And when he speaks of the Father greater than I, it doesn't mean that Jesus is any less than absolutely divine. The Son of God and God the Son. When Jesus came in His incarnation, Jesus, His position when He came and took on human flesh, He took a, 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 an inferior um, uh, 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 position in terms of, uh, of, of His uh, life and it, it, taking on the limitations of the body. But in terms of His nature and who He was, He never ceased to be God the Son, equal with the Father. But... but Paul wrote to Timothy and he said, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness that God was manifest in the flesh. And so when Jesus came in his incarnation, what he took on the limitations of human flesh, at least in omnipresence, he couldn't be everywhere all at the same time. He could only be one place at a time. And so in that sense, the Father was greater than him while still in his incarnation. And now I have told you before it comes that when it does come to pass, you may believe. The separation that's going to come, the death, the burial, the cross, the resurrection. He said, I told you all these things ahead of time, so that when it happens, you don't flip out, but it produces faith in your life. And I will no longer talk much with you. In other words, things are going to start to move fast, gentlemen, from this point forward. Remember, it's the night before the cross that he's saying these things. For the ruler of this world, the devil is coming. He has nothing in me. He has nothing that he can accuse me of, but that the world may know that I love the Father. And as the Father gave me command, so I do. Arise, let us go from here. Jesus came to die on that cross and to be buried, to rise again. He was going to obey the Father in doing that. Humbled himself to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, the Lord has exalted him. So beautiful obedience of the Son to the Father. The cross is facing them. And he declares, arise, let's go from here. So they're in that upper room in Jerusalem. Now they're going to leave that upper room, begin to make their way toward the Garden of Gethsemane. They're apparently going to pass some vineyards and all. Jesus is going to take the image of the vine and the branches to continue to speak to them things that are important on his heart for them to know, knowing that he is going to leave them shortly. And so we'll pick that up in chapter 15 uh, next week, Lord willing. So it's a chapter of comfort. Comfort for God's people through all of the ages as we live what is a glorious life, but it's a separated life. We're separated from a face-to-face relationship with Him. And so the comfort that the Lord gives us in this passage is the knowledge that heaven is being prepared for us and that Jesus is one day going to return and take us to that prepared place. That the separation, as hard as it is, allows for even greater works to be done and more people to hear the Gospel and to be saved. The comfort that is given here in the passage relating to prayer. That the communication can be in prayer as open and as natural as it would be as if Jesus was standing right next to us. That the Lord desires that our love, the expression of our love, be expressed through obedience to Him. There is the comfort that He gives of sending another helper, another comfort of the Holy Spirit. There is the comfort of Him abiding inside of us by the Holy Spirit, that He actually lives inside of us. 
We think, oh boy, if I could have just lived in Jesus' time and been right there with Him. Nothing could be better than that. But something is better than that. And that is to have Him live right inside of us. What a comfort by the Holy Spirit. And then the comfort that the Holy Spirit will teach us in the same way that Jesus taught them face to face and bring to our remembrance the Scriptures in the same way that Jesus did when He was there face to face. Then the comfort of knowing that Jesus will always give us the peace that is greater than life's circumstances. And thus, He is able to say from start to finish, let not your heart be troubled. I've covered everything that needed to be covered until I come back. Trust me on that beautiful passage from Scripture. Let's pray together.